This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. A British court agreed to extradite Abu Hamza al-Masri to the United States to face terrorism charges, including an attempt to set up an al-Qaeda training camp in the state of Oregon. Abu Hamza al-Masri is serving a seven-year sentence after being convicted by a British court for inciting violence amongst his followers. More details in Mohammed Shubaro's report. قد يمهد قرار القاضي في محكمة ويستمنستر في لندن الطريق لتسليم الدعية. The judge's decision in Westminster, London, might pave the way for extraditing the controversial cleric Abu Hamza Al Masri to the United States, but only after a series of judiciary and political procedures. Abu Hamza Al Masri is serving a seven-year sentence in the Belmarsh High Security Jail after being convicted of seven accusations of inciting racial hatred and violence. Al Masri is wanted in the United States for another set of charges, most notably conspiring to take foreign hostages in Yemen, supporting international terrorism, and conspiring to train extremists for al-Qaeda in the state of Oregon in the United States, this according to U.S. accusations. The rights of a British citizen could be breached by extraditing him to the United States to face political charges, so I strongly suspect that this case will be taken up by the European courts, like the Human Rights Court. Judge Timothy Workman said that Al Masri was denied the right to appeal his convictions, but his case needs to be referred to the Home Secretary Jackie Smith for a final decision. Al Masri could still, however, appeal the Home Secretary's decision on three levels first, in the British High Court, then in the House of Lords, which is the highest judiciary committee in England, and finally, he could appeal in the European High Court. It is known that British law prohibits extraditing any suspect to another country if that country permits the death sentence, which is the case in the United States. Sources said that the court's decision may have come after Britain was given reassurances by its ally. Britain and the U.S. made an agreement in 2003 to expedite the extradition of wanted individuals between the two countries by no longer requiring that the country requesting a prisoner provide convincing evidence. The case of Abu Hamza al-Masri returns to the forefront, but to make his extradition politically possible, it will involve removing several obstacles in the judiciary system. The most difficult of these obstacles will be to convince the European High Court of the need to extradite Abu Hamza to the United States. Muhammad Shubaru, Al Arabiya, Westminster Court, London. The Iraqi Accordance Front welcomed the Iraqi cabinet's decision to ratify the debathification law and their approval of a bill that will create a national commission for accountability and justice. Meanwhile, six people were killed when a suicide bomber blew up his booby-trapped vehicle in the middle of a provincial police chief's convoy in Iraq's northern oil city of Kirkuk. In addition, American forces killed 25 al-Qaeda suspects and arrested 21 others near Baghdad. One American soldier was killed by an explosive device in the Diyala province. The Iraqi Accordance Front and the government reached a consensus on four important laws which have been debated in the Iraqi parliament for a long time. The Iraqi Accordance Front supported the government's decision to ratify the debathification law which caused widespread political controversy and obstructed the reconciliation efforts. The bill, which allows a large number of former Ba'ath members to participate in the political process was passed through to the parliament for a vote. However, some parliament members called for the achievement of national reconciliation before passing new laws because they believe this will help the process of legislation. 
Some laws must be passed first because they are part of the national reconciliation, such as the general amnesty law and the justice and accountability bill. We actually believe that passing these laws is part of the national reconciliation. If these laws are passed, it will help achieve progress in the reconciliation project. The other laws are not directly linked to the national reconciliation project, but rather they are designed to organize the state of affairs in Iraq. Once again, government officials expressed reservations regarding the increasing activities of the tribal awakening forces, which was formed by local residents to support the United States in the fight against Al-Qaeda. The government has particular concerns that some of the armed tribe members will form militias in the future. They must be regrouped within the Iraqi Defense Ministry. We are looking for new ways to have them join the Iraqi Defense Ministry, police or national security forces. If this happens, the problem will be solved in the near future. In the middle of the day, 25 armed men were killed and 21 others were arrested during a wide-scale military operation which was launched by land and naval American forces in the last 48 hours in Tamriya, north of Baghdad. In Karkuk, six Iraqi soldiers were injured when an explosive device exploded near their patrol unit. A booby trap vehicle targeting a police convoy killed six and injured 17, including civilians. The American army announced that two of its soldiers were killed and nine others were injured in Baghdad and Diyala. Haider Jawad, Saudi Arabia Kingdom Television, Baghdad. We turn to Iraq where a car bomb has exploded next to a police convoy in the northern city of Kirkuk. A total of six people were killed, including a policeman, and 17 others were wounded in the blast. Kirkuk is a volatile ethnic and religious mix, with its oil-producing potential a source of dispute between the different groups in the city, represented in uh, Kurds, Arabs, and Turkmen. Further south, U.S. military forces reported killing 25 suspected insurgents near, near, uh, near Baghdad in what they said was the latest operation against al-Qaeda. And the Iraqi troops paraded 30 suspected insurgents in front of the cameras. The men were arrested in an operation just south of the capital. Washington says its surge of 30,000 extra troops has seriously weakened al-Qaeda. In our regional news, an Israeli military aircraft has fired missiles on a group of Palestinians in the northern Gaza Strip, killing two fighters and wounding three others. The missile strike in Beit Lahia followed rocket launches by Palestinian fighters across the border into Israel. The dead and wounded were identified as members of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, an armed wing of the Fatah faction. In the West Bank, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said the Gaza Strip's Hamas Islamist rulers must be brought down issuing his strongest call yet for their removal. He offered no details about how Hamas's removal could be accomplished. In a television address, President Abbas described the Islamic movement as a gang that forcibly took over the Gaza Strip. Elsewhere in the West Bank, Palestinians marked the 19th anniversary of their declaration of independence. In 1988, the late Palestinian President Yasser Arafat announced the establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, including Arab East Jerusalem as the capital. Arab League chief Amr Musa has stressed that all issues related to the Arab-Israeli conflict should be addressed by the U.S., hosted international peace gathering on the Middle East. Speaking after talks in Damascus with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, Mr. Musa said all what the Arabs seek from the Annapolis meeting is that it launches serious negotiations under international supervision. President Assad, for his part, said any peace initiative that excludes the occupied Golan Heights will not be serious and will not achieve a just and comprehensive peace in the region. On the other hand, the Secretary General of the United Nations Ban Ki-moon has arrived in Beirut in a bid to persuade feuding Lebanese leaders to reach a consensus on a new president for the country. Upon arrival, he went into immediate meetings with Maronite Patriarch Nasrallah Sfer, who is expected to present a list of presidential candidates. Mr. Ki-moon's visit comes as part of international and Arab efforts led by France to draw a mechanism for a solution. According to know as you all, and that the political situation in Lebanon is complex and difficult. The country now stands at an important crossroad in its modern history. A free and fair election of a new president 
according to constitutional rules without a foreign interference is a milestone in the development of Lebanon uh, as a vibrant democracy. One year and four months after Israel's bombing of Lebanon's power plant in Jie caused an environmental catastrophe, efforts are still being deployed to help save Lebanon's ecosystem. With the first phase of the cleanup process finished, phase two is underway in dozens of beaches on the coast. Follow this report. This is when it all began, on July 15, 2006. Israeli Air Force jets bombed one of Lebanon's power plants situated on its Mediterranean shores, leading to the spewing of some 12,000 tons of oil fuel into the sea. It poisoned the entirety of the Lebanese coastline and extended beyond. Days and even months later, this is what you would see when walking on a beach. With time, local and international pledges poured in to help Lebanon kickstart the first phase of the cleanup process. More than one year later, phase two begins. Hade Mitri, the oil spill communicator officer at the Ministry of Environment, explains. Phase one was the removal of liquid fuel oil that was mobile and that can, be pollute, that can pollute new sites. That was critical that it is removed and bulk quantities of fuel and heavily polluted debris that is, available, that is found on these sites. So phase one ended, the MOE, the Ministry of Environment, carried out reassessment of all these sites north to south, which totaled around 70 sites. And and uh, based on the reassessment, about 32 sites were, were found as needing phase two work that should be cleaned to a higher level of cleanliness. And this time it's cleaning rocks and rocky sediments, not the removal of liquid fuel oil that was finished in February 2007. Once the second phase is finished, it's time for waste management. It involves treatment and disposal, and Lebanon is not at this stage ready for treatment and disposal of this waste. So um, we're looking at studies on how best and in the most environmentally friendly way to dispose of this waste. Treat, reuse, incinerate or send it landfill in hazardous landfills or, ha or hazardous incinerators. Fifty million dollars had been pledged mostly by the European Union to help Lebanon with this disaster. But only 15 million dollars or 5% of the funds have actually been injected into the cleanup process. Pledges are not given to the ministry but are rather used directly by donating nations to subcontractors who handle the manual labor. The ministry is charged with overlooking and coordinating the work in progress. Among the various donors is USAID. It has been charged with the cleanup of beaches north of Beirut, from Tabarja, one of the most contaminated sites, to Enfe. This site is situated in Jbil and is undergoing phase two of the cleanup process. And even with the latest technology and efforts, Tony Shamron of the Promar Marine Contracting Firm says that only 90% of Lebanon's coast will be clean once the job is done. Funds from Japan, Norway and Spain are to facilitate the cleanup of beaches in Beirut, Jie, the Palm Island of Tripoli and beaches in the area. The Lebanese coast is 225 kilometers in length from uh, the southern borders to the northern borders. 150 kilometers from Jadra to the northern borders were damaged, but not all at the same intensity or distance or uh, uh, stretch. For example, sites that were heavily polluted were all the sites from Jadra to Beirut, so to the, to the head of Beirut. All those sites heavily polluted. And then the oil, the oil hit the head of Beirut and because of currents and the way of the topography of the land, it skipped the area of Juni, mm -hmm. which is just north of Beirut, and hit Biblos, Jbel, Amphi, all the way to the north of Beirut. If all goes as planned, the cleanup process is to remove major traces of the spill by mid-2008. But neither technology nor time can completely heal the scars carved on Lebanon's coastline by the oil slick. On the contrary, it's only with passing seasons that Lebanon will really know the extent of the damage the spill inflicted on its marine environment. There are reports today that Syria is likely to attend the upcoming Annapolis Peace Conference. For details on that and other diplomatic moves, we go to our Tel Aviv studio now where IBA's diplomatic correspondent Leah Zinder is standing by. Welcome, Leah. 
Yes, thank you, Yochanan. As you say, according to today's edition of the Egyptian Al Ahram newspaper, Syrian President Bashar al Assad has decided to attend the Annapolis summit. This after he was assured by Russia and by PA President Mahmoud Abbas that the United States would extend Syria a formal invitation to the parley and possibly get a, he might get a mention in the closing statement of the summit as well. But meanwhile, here at home, support for Prime Minister Ayoud's policies on Annapolis are coming under critical scrutiny not just from the opposition, but from the right wing of his coalition as well. One sign of that came in the Knesset yesterday, when coalition Knesset members joined the right wing opposition in passing the preliminary reading of a bill that would require a two thirds majority in the House in order to make any changes to the Jerusalem Basic Law. The move was, of course, meant as a warning to Olmert not to make any concessions on Jerusalem in his negotiations with the Palestinians. And there's more. There's trouble in the cabinet as well. Deputy Premier Victor Lieber says he aims to drag Prime Minister Olmert, as he puts it, into demanding that the Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state as a prerequisite for Annapolis. Throughout this week, as we've all been hearing, Palestinian officials right up to Prime Minister Salam Fayyad have been saying publicly they will never recognize Israel as a Jewish homeland. One of the issues that most concerns Olmert's opponents, uh, on the other hand, is the Prime Minister's statement in contradiction to the roadmap that he's ready first to negotiate a final status deal with the Palestinians Palestinians, and only at the end of that process to demand Palestinian action against terrorism. A source close to Olmert told me this afternoon, when the roadmap was first formulated by the Quartet, Israel had no negotiating partner on the Palestinian side. Now we do, and therefore the change is justified. Well, critics of the Prime Minister, including those in his own government, are saying it was a mistake to make that enormous concession and get absolutely nothing in return. A British parliamentary delegation has arrived in Tehran and the group of six nations will be meeting this month on November 19th to discuss the Iranian nuclear file. Our correspondent from Tehran, Mohammed Jawad Hassan, has this report. A British parliamentary delegation headed by the President of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Commons, Mike Gibbs, arrived in Tehran for a visit that will last five days. It is expected that this delegation will meet with senior Iranian officials and discuss the most important issues of mutual interest. However, the Iranian nuclear file will be the core of these talks. After meeting with the head of the National Security and Foreign Affairs Council of the Islamic Shura Council, Allah Adin Brujali, Gibbs announced that his country, Britain, will never request that Iran suspend its nuclear activities, but that London supports nuclear activities for peaceful use. He reiterated his country's support for using diplomatic means to resolve the Iranian nuclear issue. There were British requests. They wanted clarification about Iran's political practices and how it has acted towards resolutions passed by international organizations, like the group of five plus one. For our part, we asked them questions to clarify their positions so that we may respond. We are waiting for their answers. This position comes amidst a statement by the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who called for an international ban on oil and gas investments in Iran. Meanwhile, Germany and France supported the double policy of dialogue and sanctions as the best way to deal with the Iranian nuclear program. The group plus one countries are expected to meet on November 19th to discuss the two reports by Javier Solana and Mohamed Baradei in order to draw up a new position on how to deal with the Iranian file. The double policy is the major power's new policy towards Tehran. It is a combination of negotiations and sanctions. The British delegation to Tehran may have taken place under this framework. However, today looks very much like yesterday when the policy of double containment failed to limit Tehran. Syrian Arabic Television, Mohammed Jawad Hassan, Tehran.
أعلنت المصادر الطبية الفلسطينية وفاة المواطن. Medical sources in Gaza announced the death of Aida Zuhair Abd Al Al at age 31, a cancer patient. Aida died due to the shortage of medicine in Gaza and the siege that prevented her from traveling outside for treatment. <laughs> ما ذنب الأطفال السبعة؟ ماذا يقول الأطفال لهذه المأساة التي حلت بهم؟ What crime did these seven children commit, and what do they have to say about the siege that caused this tragedy? Is there anyone in the world with a conscience to end this suffering? We call on the world to acknowledge and end this humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The deceased cancer patient, Aida Zuhair Abdel Al, is the eighth casualty as a result of the extreme shortage in medication and the inability to transport patients outside of Gaza for proper medical attention. The head of the People's Committee Against the Siege, Representative Jamal Al Khudari, called on the whole world to demand an end to the siege, making it possible for these people to live in peace. We call on each person with a heart and conscience, Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians and foreigners, to stand by our Palestinian people to end the siege so they can live. Zakaria Abdel Al, the husband of the deceased, talked about the thousands of cancer patients in the Shifa hospital and the extreme shortage of medication. He wondered why the ill were being punished. With my own eyes, I saw dozens of people suffering from the same illness and with the same predicament of a shortage of medicine, but no one seems to hear their voices. I don't understand why this is happening. What did the ill do to deserve this? The sick have nothing to do with the siege, the Jews, or anything else. Al Khudari praised the initiative of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which offers 50 complete kidney dialysis units to Palestinian hospitals and health centers. We got word today from Saudi Arabia that they plan to send us 50 kidney dialysis machines. We commend this effort and ask that they not delay in delivering them to Gaza. We also need more medical equipment and more medicine. The people most affected by this oppressive siege are the civilians in general and the ill in particular. Shouldn't everyone with a conscience call on ending the siege? The report by the IAEA chief on Iran was finally out hours ago. In his report to the Board of Governors, Mohammad al baradei discussed the implementation by Iran of MPT safeguards, the enforcement of working plan, and outstanding questions on Tehran's nuclear program. The report highlights gains the two sides have made in the modality plan, namely P1 and P2 centrifuges. It also touches on the trend of Iran IAEA talks in recent months when Tehran provided answers for questions the UN nuclear agency has raised. In another reaction, head of Iran's atomic energy organization Reza Azadeh says with regard to El Baradei's report, there would be no legal justification for discussing Tehran's nuclear case at the UN Security Council. The Iranian atomic chief told the IRIB Channel 1 on Thursday, those who have obstructed Iran's nuclear work over the past years should be held responsible for the trampled rights of the Iranian nation. Azadeh called on the five plus one group to adopt a wise approach and respect other nations' rights and said the IAEA chief's report opens yet further ways for expansion of cooperation for settlement of Iran's nuclear case, a significant point which should be taken into serious consideration by world powers. A new report by the world's nuclear watchdog has found that Iran has been generally truthful about its nuclear program, but more cooperation is needed. Tehran goes further, saying the report vindicates the country's uranium enrichment program, maintaining that it's for making electricity, not for nuclear weapons. But as Al Jazeera's Tim Friend now reports, Washington is still demanding new sanctions against Iran. 
Iran has seized on this latest report from the UN nuclear watchdog. It says that Tehran has provided information about its past activities, as well as details of nuclear design that the International Atomic Energy Agency had been demanding since 2005. Findings of the agency are in line with Iran's responses, and I think that this is an important article, and many accusations are now baseless, and those powers that base their accusations on this, I hope that they will reconsider what they have said. But the nuclear watchdog report also says that Iran still has 3,000 centrifuges at its plant at Natanz. It's still defying the UN Security Council by enriching uranium. And its cooperation was reactive rather than proactive. The United States response along with the UK was to demand further sanctions against Iran. Based on our review of the document, it is clear that Iran has not fully cooperated. Uh, the IEA has not had full access to uh, P1 and P2 centrifuges. Uh, Iran has not uh, suspended, according to IEA, its enrichment of uranium. Western nations accuse Iran of seeking to build atomic bombs under cover of a civilian nuclear program. Tehran insists its nuclear plans are purely civilian and aimed at generating electricity. The report says that there might be, because of the inconsistency in the chronology of the centrifuge development, there might be some other programs related to the military which IAEA cannot verify. So it is a mixed reaction. The report will form the basis of discussions when representatives of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, along with Germany, meet on Monday in Brussels. Tim Friend, Al Jazeera. Hi, I'm Jamal Dejani, producer of the show you've just been watching, Mosaic, World News from the Middle East. Just a short while ago, we came to you asking for your help to keep Mosaic on the air. We needed to raise $200,000, and I'm happy to announce that we did it. No, as a matter of fact, you did it. More than 1,600 of you helped us to reach our goal, and I want to thank you on behalf of the Mosaic team right here at Link TV for your support. Stay informed, keep watching, and thank you again. One nation, many voices. The stories of Muslims in America. At work, at play, having fun. What is life like for the millions of people in this country who practice Islam? And then finally I looked in my heart. So I'm here, he can't Even today, Muslims still no Kind of in limbo. Now's your chance to share stories of Muslims in America in our One Nation, Many Voices online film contest. We're awarding $50,000 in cash prizes divided among six categories, comedy, drama, documentary, animation or music, a special category for filmmakers 18 and under, plus films under 60 seconds long. You don't have to be a Muslim to enter or to vote for your favorite films online. You just have to live in the United States. The new deadline for entries is December 31st, 2007. So hurry, check out details at linktv.org slash one nation. One nation, many voices, Muslims in America. Stories, not stereotypes. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. 
programs which connect you to the world.